As you can see, the title of my talk is Exploring the Interplay Between Communication and Social Determinant of Health. Have you guys heard about Social Determinant of Health before? SDH? Yeah, it is really hot term in preventive medicine, health communication, and public health. So social determinant of health. Let me briefly define this concept first. Social determinant of health is the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. So employment conditions, housing, education, income, and so on and so forth. So our health is determined by not only by individuals' health behaviors, and healthcare access at an individual level, but also by social determinant of health. So before giving my talk today, let me give you the overview of my research. So as you can see, I have three major lines of research. The first, the most important line of research is exploring the interplay between communication and social environment. Okay, many scholars have argued that social environment such as physical structure, whether our community has a quality grocery store, whether our community has fitness center, whether our city has nice hospital. Those are physical structure. And social structure, how, how our society is organized, like income inequality is really bad for health. And also social cohesion, how cohesive our society is really important for our health. So among a variety of social environmental factors, my research has been focusing on the concept of social capital. I should not touch this. <laughs> Oops. I told you. <laughs> so but uh, the relationship between social capital and health has received considerable attention. I mean, it produced numerous articles. And as a communication scientist, I have been looking at how individuals' communication behaviors interact with social capital and jointly influences health-related cognitions and behaviors. And I list some papers, recent papers, in under this first line of research. And the second line of research is closely related to the first one, and it's about health disparities. So health disparity is one of the most uh, important topics among public health researchers and health communication scholars. And I found out that JUC, Journal of Communication, actually devoted a special issue about this topic in 2013. So health disparity is quite important topic for communication scholars as well. And health disparities can be briefly defined as the phenomena that uh, disadvantaged social groups, such as the poor, racial ethnic minorities, and women, systematically experience worse health or greater health risk than uh, more advantaged groups. Okay? That is health disparities. Then again, as a communication student, I looked at how communication, what, what kind of role that communication can play in eliminating health disparities. And third, the third line of research is uh, media effect studies in the context of disinformation and contradictory information. Uh, in the context of nutrition and e-cigarettes and cancer. So you guys uh, know Leticia, Leticia Bode and Emily Fraga. They are graduate from School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at Wisconsin Medicine. Emily Fraga and Leticia Bode uh, wrote a lot of articles about misinformation fake news in the context of health co uh, in political communication, but my <coughs> work focuses on health communication. So among these three lines of research, today I'm going to talk about the first and second, and then more specifically, I'm going to focus on four studies, okay? So one, one uh, so let me start from 2016 uh, JMCQ article. So this is an article entitled Mapping the Social Capital Research in Communication, a Bibliometric Analysis. So, am I too fast? So if you're not clear about anything, please feel free to interrupt. Okay. Uh, so in this paper, I try to identify the most influential, influential articles or articles in the introduction and nurturing the concept of social capital in the field of communication. I think you guys are quite familiar with the concept of social capital, right? 
because Wisconsin is the center of social capital research in the field of communication, as you can see very soon. But I wanted to see it empirically. I wanted to demonstrate what kind of authors, what kind of articles play a key role in introducing social capital and nurturing this concept in the field of communication because social capital was developed by sociologists and political scientists and communication scholars actually imported that concept from other disciplines to our field. And so I wanted to see how communication scholars exchange that concept and nurture that concept and thereby building and maintaining a research community in the field of communication. And using a citation network analysis. So citation network analysis is really useful to examine the production and diffusion of knowledge in a given academic area. I mean, think about citation. When you guys write a paper, well, how do you choose an article or author to cite? It's not a neutral process. So by choosing an article or author to cite, a scholar is implicitly showing his or her allegiance to a specific particular section of the academic community. So by doing citation network analysis, we can, we can find out how a, an area of specialization, how a field is constituted. Because those field and area of specialization is constituted based on a collection of articles connected with one another through citation practices. Okay? So briefly speaking, there are two separate approaches, two separate schools of social capital research in the field, in the academia. The first one is social cohesion or communitarian approach. I'm pretty sure you're quite familiar with the first one. It is represented by Robert Putnam. And Robert Putnam <coughs> and a lot of communication scholars like Devon Shah and Louis Friedland and Dietram Schoenfeller and a lot of Wisconsin political communication superstars follow Robert Putnam's conceptualization. Okay? Robert Putnam views social capital as features of collectives. It's not my social capital or my group social capital. It's Madison social capital, Wisconsin social capital, USA social capital. It's trans-individual level construct, ecological construct. Okay? And briefly, it can, social capital, according to this goal, can be briefly defined as how cohesive our society is. Okay? That is the key idea of social capital according to the first school of social capital research. But quite different conceptualization was produced by Peter Boudy and James Coleman. This is also called, this is called a social network approach or social network school of social capital research. And so according to the second school or second approach, social capital can be briefly defined as actual or potential resources that individuals and potentially groups have access to through their social networks. And those two conceptualization is quite different. Let me, let me elaborate on this. So Robert Putnam's, let me briefly talk about the underlying idea of Robert Putnam's social capital. So let's say, if a society consists of its members who actively participate in common issues, and if those if those members of the society trust with one another, we can say that that society has great resources to deal with its common problems, and that society is better in terms of achieving its common goals. Okay? And social capital according to the first school, and it consists of structural dimension and cognitive dimension. Structural dimension is captured by formal group activities and informal socializing within a society, and cognitive dimension is captured by norms of reciprocity and social trust. And more importantly for my talk, scholars found out that a society with high levels of social capital are more likely to be safe, so free from violent crimes. And a, a society with high levels of social capital tend to have better, more effective governance, and more likely to be healthy. So actually, if you live in social capital rich state, you are more likely to be better health. 
So I, because of time limit, I cannot give you all the statistics. But social state level social capital and county level social capital predict county level and state level health outcomes. Okay, and the second school, then Pierre Bourdieu's conceptualization is really different, really different. Robert Putnam is based on structural functionalism. You guys heard about structural functionalism, right, in communication research method course. Structural functionalism assumes that members of a society can come up with agreed upon needs and goals, and structural functionalism posits that every part should cooperate for the survival of the whole. That is the key idea of structural functionalism as a paradigm, right? But Pierre Bourdieu's conceptualization of social capital is based on conflict paradigm, Karl Marx, Karl Marx paradigm. So Pierre Bourdieu came up with this concept in order to explain how the social inequalities is reproduced, produced and reproduced over generation. Okay? So let's say, if I'm really rich, if I'm really rich, and if I belong to high social class, I'm not, but hypothetically, so if I have really a lot of money, and, and I belong to high social class, and I have one son, <coughs> then I can provide really quality education to my son, right? So my economic capital is transferred to cultural capital, and my son will have, will show high levels of educational attainment, and my son may develop high class social taste, right? Those are cultural capital, and using that social cap cultural capital, he can make friends with people from high class. Then those people become, will become his social capital, and also using my economic capital, I can make friends from high class, high social class, then those individuals will become social capital to my son over time, right? In that way, economic capital possessed by high class people will hand it down to the next generation over time in a format form of cultural and social capital. So the idea, think about this. So Pierre Bourdieu's approach is quite different from Robert Putnam's approach, right? So this approach deals with social capital as individual or group level property. But Robert Putnam's approach view social capital as ecological construct, the features of a collective. Those are two quite different ideas. And using citation network analysis, I wanted to empirically demonstrate what kind of school have considerable attention from communication scholars, whereas what kind of school receive less attention. Okay? So uh, uh, let me come back to this later. So in order to identify relevant communication literature, I looked at communication abstract. So I found uh, 171 articles. Among 171 literature, there, there was one book and three book chapters, but because there are not that many, so I'm going to use the article from now on, okay? And 2,000, 2,037 in-text citations. So I conducted a, I examined how 171 articles cited each other and to creating 171 times 171 square matrix form. And then I conducted two analysis. One is in degree centrality, and the second one is uh, gain pass analysis. Have you guys heard about uh, the term in degree centrality? So let's say, uh, one article is recited by other articles, then it's like it's the, the arrow comes from other articles to me, right? So this is in degree. But if I cite other articles, then its arrow goes toward outside. This is out degree. So the basic assumption is if one article is cited by other articles a lot, then the importance or influence of that article increases. Okay? That is the fundamental idea of in-degree centrality. So I calculated the in-degree centrality score for all of the 171 articles. So that we can identify the prominent articles in the social capital literature in the field of communication. And at the same time, I did main path analysis because 
main path analysis can redress two limitations of in-degree centrality. So let's say, if CJ cite T term Choi Fele, and T term Choi Fele cite Dominic Brossard, but if CJ does not cite Dominic Brossard, but still, still, CJ is indirectly related to Dominic Brossard, right? Through D trump You see what I mean? But integrity centrality cannot capture that kind of indirect linkages. So integrity centrality is, should be directly cited by other articles in order to become influential. But you can see that there are a lot of a lot of articles preaching other articles, right? Like D term should be that. So in, in that way, main pass analysis can redress one important limitation of integrity centrality. And second, think about integrity centrality and citation. I mean, almost always, almost always, new articles can cite old articles, right? Old articles cannot cite new articles. That is not possible. So you guys can see that, oh, then all the articles should be treated as important. It can be biased, right? Sometimes new articles can be more influential. So integral centrality is limited in that regard as well. But by using main path analysis, we can actually divide, divide the, the total number of any specific article is located on the path linking all the articles, divide it by the total possible linkages among any articles, then we can actually control for the, the time temporal nature of citation. You see what I mean? So that's why I conducted integral centrality analysis and main path analysis. In addition, I conducted a detailed citation content analysis. So I analyzed all the 2037 in-text citations. When, you, when we work on a paper, we cite at the end of the paragraph or at the end of each sentence, we should put in-text citation, right? So I collected 2037 citations about social capital and analyzed how communication scholars cited Robert Putnam, Peter Bouldy, and James Coleman whether it cited each of these authors in a substantive manner or supplementary manner or passing manner. Substantive manner means they treated each of these scholars as the main source of conceptualization and operationalization. And supplementary citation is not, not trivial, but is not that serious, like substantive. And passing, citation passing means just mention scholar and the year. When you guys write a paper, we sometimes just do not read a specific article, just recognize name and year, right? And we do not seriously treat that article. That kind of in-text citation is classified as passing. Okay. So just take a look at the result. So this table shows top 15 most cited articles among social capital literature and communication. As you can see, the the, the first one is Duan Xia, McLeod, and Yoon in 2001 in CR. And the second one, Xia, Pa Corbett, Lance Corbett in 2001 political communication. And Nicole Ellison, Patricia Moy, T. Trump, T. Trump, and Duban, uh, Dimitri Williams, Xia, Xia, and Christopher Bidoin, and so on and so forth. And main path analysis. So the first two, Patricia Moy, Shoi Fele, Forbert, 1999, Mass Comment Society, and the second, Christopher Bidoin, 2008, and Shah, Shah, Bidoin, Shah, Bidoin, Shoi Fele, Kern, Bidoin, and so on and so forth. So basically, you, we can see that these, almost all of these articles, heavily focused on Robert Putnam's conceptualization of social capital. Okay? And in addition, so this is the figure. Drive, uh, drawn from, uh, derived from the main path analysis. So as you can see, the bottom, Michael Kern 1997 and Patrick Shamoy 1999, these are the root articles where the discussion of social capital started in the field of communication. They started the discussion of social capital, but as you can see, it is through G. Trump and Shaw paper in 2000 in CR, and that attracted the attention from the field. So they started, but this is the article 
Ti Chang Shui Fen and Shah's article started to attract the field of attention to the concept of social capital. And then the discussion grew through Tuban Shah, 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 Pidoi, 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 Pidoi. So in this way, you can, we can see that how in, in, in a given academic area, how a particular concept is introduced and grew through these kind of backbone of the literature. This is called as main path, okay? And then in addition, as you can see, this is the result of my detailed citation content analysis. So among 2,000, about 2,000 citations, as you can see, 67, 68% are for Putnam, right? And contrast, 19% for the 14% Corbin. So we can see the disproportionate influence of Putnam here. And also, so most visible difference is in the substantive category. So 88%, 88% citation for Putnam is substantive. That means communication scholars rely heavily on Robert Putnam when they conceptualize and measure social capital, right? Rather than Puldi, 9%, James Coleman, about 3%, okay? So here, so don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that social cohesion school is wrong, social network school is better. No, that is not my argument. Both lines of research is really valuable and can provide us really rich insight for studying communication processes and effects. And my previous research has also followed the conceptualization of Robert Putnam. So let me show you a few articles of my research in this area. So the first one uh, with Daniel Kim, uh, the, the, this article is titled A Comparative Analysis of the Validity of U.S. State and County Level Social Capital Measures and Their Associations with Population Health. So you guys may remember that in the beginning of my talk, a lot of scholars showed that state level, U.S. state level and U.S. county level social capital actually predict state level health index and county level health index. So, I mean, every year some, some research institute publish which city is the highest in terms of social capital and which city or which state is the healthiest. So you can see those newspaper articles. And, but the problem is that we found out that there is no agreed upon and widely shared measure of ecological social capital measures. So Daniel Kimai and I are collected social capital measures and developed a few social capital measures using official statistics and administrative record and publicly available survey data set. And then did some kind of extensive validity test. And the second one, this article was published in CR in 2014. Again, this paper is also based on Robert Putnam's conceptualization of social capital in the context of National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign. Have you guys heard about this campaign? National Youth Anti-Drug Media Campaign. It was between 1998 and 2004. It uses about $1 billion appropriated by U.S. Congress. But do you know what happened about this campaign? This campaign, the, the goal of this campaign was to prevent American children and adolescents from initiating use of any illegal drugs and to convince occasional drug users to stop. But what, what scholars found out that this campaign had boomerang effect. So American children and adolescents watched this campaign as they are more likely to use inhalant, cocaine, and drug, drugs, and so on and so forth. So it has really boomerang effect. Have you guys heard about this? This is really famous. Was that the one you're braining on drugs with an egg in the frying pan? No, it's, it's, not yeah, it's, it's a different one. Yeah, a different one. So, so in the context of national, so, so one billion dollars is just wasted, but not just wasted, it just actually harms the United States. Okay? So in the context of this National Youth Entertainment Media campaign, I captured social capital at an individual level and macro social level as well. I think this research is important because although a predominant majority of studies, social capital studies and communication rely on Robert Putnam's approach, 
they tend to measure social capital only at an individual level. Okay? So that's why in this paper, to redress that limitation, in this paper I capture social capital at both individual and social macro level at the same time. And the third paper, so with Jennifer Kemp published in CR again in 2015. So this paper is also based on Robert Putnam's approach. And I wanted to empirically test then how, how the, the mechanisms under which, by which social capital produces <coughs> pro health outcomes. So by adopting Martin Fishbein's theory of plant behavior. As you guys may be familiar with theory of plant behavior, right? So anyway, so far I followed Robert Putnam's approach to social capital, but so this is my uh, online first article in health communication. From this research, I wanted to take advantage of social network approach as well. Because by adopting social network approach, we can actually empirically test some of the argument by classic communication and media effect theories like knowledge gap hypothesis. You guys heard about knowledge gap hypothesis and diffusion of innovation and communication inequality and so on and so forth. Okay? So uh, let me show you how we can utilize network approach in communication research. Okay? So this is uh, research with my former student at SNU, so Kwang Ho and Bia. So let's take a look at, so this paper is based on the data from two-way longitudinal panel survey with a nationwide quota sample so uh, based on age, gender, and region of Korean adults over 40 years old. So we interviewed the same respondents twice, okay? Once in May 2014, and we followed the same respondents three months later again. Why did I do that? In order to make strong causal claim. Okay. So this is the research model. I think that it's so small, so it, it may be hard to see, but let me briefly explain this research model. Because the first, these are health-related motivation. So cancer-specific and health motivation in general. So personal cancer history, family cancer history, cancer worry, and health consciousness. <coughs> health consciousness means I think health is important to me. I'm doing anything to stay healthy and so on and so forth. So these health-related motivation actually promote media use for stomach cancer information. I, this study focuses on stomach cancer because stomach cancer is really prevalent in South Korea. So media use for uh, inquire, so acquire stomach cancer-related information and then reflective integration. So reflective integration measure is adopted by Sharon Donnubi here, Sharon Donnubi, and William Ebland measurement is modified in the context of stomach cancer. So Reflective integration is elaboration, elaboration of information acquired from media and interpersonal discussion relevant to that information. Okay? So motivation leads to information acquisition and then processing that information and finally leads to health knowledge. Okay? So this is simple multiple step mediation model. And these three, health motivation and media use and reflective, reflective integration comes from the baseline survey and knowledge came from follow-up survey even after controlling for baseline knowledge. Okay? So this is the research model. So as you can see, so let's take a look at the first part. So as you can see, personal cancer history predict media use. This is unstandardized coefficient. The standardized coefficient was 0.11, okay? And then cancer worry actually predict media use is 0.17, standardized coefficient 0.17. And then, so media use and then reflective integration was statistically significant and positive. So after acquiring stomach cancer information from media, people are more likely to talk about it and think about it. So the, the standardized coefficient was 0.6 and then after think about it and talk about it and finally lead to knowledge acquisition even after contouring for baseline knowledge. So that, that means 
the effect, effect of reflective integration on knowledge is the causal claim can be very strong. Okay? And the, the effect size was 0.16. Okay? So reflective integration of media information actually increases knowledge gains three months later, even after controlling for baseline, the initial starting point of knowledge. But more interesting finding is multi-group analysis. As you can see, I divided the, to the total respondent into two groups, high social capital individuals and low social capital individuals, and take a look at whether the effect of associations among the key variables are different. Then, then how can I measure social capital here by adopting peer Buddhist measurement conceptualization of social capital. Uh, let, me, let me briefly explain how I concept, operationalized social capital here. So Pierre Puldi, Pierre Puldi did not come up with empirical measurement. But a lot of you guys may be quite empirically oriented, quantitatively oriented. Then we should actually need empirically falsifiable measurement, right? Not just conceptualizing, we need a measurement. That measurement was provided by Nan Nim. Nan Nim is a Duke sociologist. She actually came up with a measurement called position generator. So position generator is like this. So we provide a list of jobs. Do you know lawyer? Do you know congressman? Do you know bellboy? Do you know janitor? Do you know babysitter? And so on and so forth. So we provide a list of jobs with different job prestige score. And then we ask respondent whether they know each jobs, okay? And then we calculate three things. One, upper reachability. So how high you can reach in social hierarchy. So let's say if you know President Trump, then your upper reachability is the highest maximum, right? But all I know is, no, no offense, janitor or garbage man and so on and so forth, then your upper reachability is low. You can see what I'm saying? So upper reachability captures the quality of social capital. But that's the first one. The second one, extensity. Extensity means among like 20 to 30 jobs, how many jobs you can have access to. That is extensity, that is value. The quantity of your social capital. And third, range. The difference between highest reachable job and lowest job is diversity of your social capital. Okay? In that way, and, but, but among so upper reachability, range, and extensity are highly correlated with one another. So using principal component analysis, we tend to combine, come up with a comprehensive social capital index. And using that index, I divided individuals into two groups, high social capital group and low social capital group. And then I found out this. So reflective integration increases stomach cancer knowledge only among those with high levels of social capital. You see the three stars, only one group, right? And among those with low levels of social capital, even if, even though they talk about the media information they acquired, even though they think about the media information very carefully, they are less likely to learn from it. But if you have high levels of social capital, if you talk about the media information, and if you think carefully about media information, you're more likely to learn from it, okay? So it sounds very sim familiar to you guys, right? So this can trace back to 1970s knowledge gap hypothesis. Teacher and Dono provided four speculative explanations about why knowledge gap phenomenon occurs, right? One of the four explanations is the disparities, inequalities in terms of size and quality of our social network. But still, we call those explanations as speculative. But now, using position generator, we can actually empirically test the classical speculative explanation, right? So in that way, in this way, we can do a lot of great research, good research, using the another marginalized approach to social capital, okay? Then let me move on to the second topic for today's talk. I mean, I spent a lot of time, so let me, let me be very brief. So this is an under review article with uh, my former doctoral advisor at UIUC. 
So the title is A Communication Inequalities Approach to Disparities in Physical Activities, the Case of the Verb Campaign. Have you guys heard about Verb Campaign? Verb Campaign was conducted by CDC between the year 2002 and 2006. And the Verb is their brand name. So they adopted the commercial advertising, commercial advertising strategy. And the Verb Campaign, the, the goal of Verb Campaign is promote physical activities among children, American children, aged 9 and 13, also known as twins, okay? So, there are a lot of articles about uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this campaign, and they found out that this campaign was a huge success. So when American children were exposed to the bird campaign messages, they were more likely to engage in physical activities, <coughs> which is great, it's nice. But in this paper, Mark Karina and I wanted to see whether this campaign was equally effective among different social economic groups and equally effective across different racial ethnic groups. And the answer was, it was not. So, firm campaign was more effective for children from high income families, high education families, and firm campaign was more effective for Caucasian families. Okay? So it actually increases pre-existing social disparities in terms of physical activity because we all know that high, children from high income families and children from high education families are more likely to engage in organized, organized physical activities. Then this campaign actually exacerbates the pre-existing social disparities. Again, racial ethnic group as well. So, so let me ask fundamental question then. Then communication has any role to play to redress health disparities? I mean, unconsciously or unintentionally, communication campaigns, communication health campaigns actually reinforce or even worsen the health disparities, pre existing health disparities, right? It's not just verb. As you can see, a lot of mass media campaigns intended to uh, promote smoking cessation and folic acid intake. Have you guys heard about folic, folic acid intake? These campaigns actually, folic acid intake campaigns actually worsens, worsens the folate status between high SES group and low SES group. And smoking cessation campaigns tend to be more effective among high SES group. So basically, the mass media communication campaign tend to, tend to be less likely to be effective among low SES group and among racial ethnic minorities. Okay? And so, among, among many types of public health interventions that are not effective among low socioeconomic position, there's one common factor. That one common factor was they are heavily focused on information delivery or education. So through using, uh, using mass media campaign or curriculum based activities in, in school and counseling or group education, those interventions are less likely to be effective among low social economic position groups. Okay? Then, then, okay. So, the, so we, we, can, we can actually classify public health intervention uh, using the, the distinction between agentic strategy versus stru structural strategy. Agentic strategy is much more individual focused. Individuals should act upon their message to make healthy choices. But structural strategy targets structure, context, or setting, or social environment. Okay? And we all know that. Structural strategies are more effective to reduce health disparities. Think about uh, flu fluoridation of drinking water, and think about the mandatory seatbelt regulations, and think about uh, indoor clean air laws. Those policies are equally effective among low SES groups and equally effective among racial ethnic minority groups, right? So, Think about the effectiveness of specific public health intervention. 
structuring innovation is the answer. We know that. But then the question becomes that why? Why many, why high agency, agentic intervention still dominate in the United States? That is because of a perception that structural innovations are less acceptable to various stakeholders. Politicians and policymakers do not like adopt structural interventions because that is very complicated, politically very complex. And those kind of interventions, structural interventions, may face civil libertarian argument. Why government to say, to force me to do something? I have freedom to choose whatever I want to drink. Why government should invent laws or regulation, right? That kind of opposition may come up here, right? Then, so here I think mass communication is play, should play a critical role here. So communication should build consensus and promote collective actions. So let me, let me spend two minutes. So along these lines, I conduct, I'm currently working on this paper examining the roles of communication and political trust in addressing health disparities. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, the result here. So this is what I found. Take, let's take a look at this. So x-axis is exposure to health disparity information from mediated and consumer <coughs> sources. And y-axis is public support for government intervention to address health disparities. Okay? As you can see, and the moderator is trust in government. So as you can see, as we are more likely to be exposed to health-related information, we are more likely to support government action to address health disparities only among those with high levels of trust in government, right? The mean level, flat and low levels of trust, it actually decreases public support. And also this, this is based on two-way longitudinal panel survey, so we can make really strong causal claim here. Okay, so the means, can you guess what is the mean of political trust in 2014 among American adults? It's nationally representative sample. One to five. One, no confidence at all. Two, very little confidence, three, some confidence, four, a lot of confidence, five, complete confidence. Trust in government. What is the mean? Can you guys guess? Mm -hmm. 2.22. 2 2.22 is the mean, and the standard deviation was 0.77. So, so here I said this is high level of social trust, political trust, but it's not high. It's just 2.22 plus 0.77 is about 3. So some confidence. So only when Americans have some confidence about the government, okay, and, and they are more like they are exposed to health disparity information, they are more likely to support government intervention to redress health disparity. This is what I found. And also what I found was this. So when we are exposed to health disparity information from media in the sources, we are more likely to engage in personal activism, political participation, to help the cause of redressing uh, health disparities. Okay? So in that way, I think even though a lot of mass communication campaigns tend to reinforce, even make worse health disparities, communication still matters in terms of mobilizing public support for government and actions and mobilizing political participation to redress health disparities. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you.